Hello. Yeah, it's working. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege for me to mediate this panel with such amazing women. Uh, I'll go introduce them properly in a minute. Uh, my name is Andrea Dip. I am an investigative journalist from Brazil. I'm currently living in Berlin as a visiting scholar at Latin America Institute of the Freie Universität. And I am also part of the IRGAC. Uh, I investigated the advance of Christian fundamentalism in Latin America, especially in Brazil, and how it interferes with institutional politics, public, public policies, reprodu reproductive rights, and LGBTQ plus rights. And I wrote a book about the evangelical bench in National Congress in Brazil. So, um, just a little introduction to our panel. Um, two days ago, I was, in the sub I was on the subway station here in Berlin, uh, sitting next to a lady. And we stayed there for a while because the Uber was late. And when the train arrived, she got up, took, off, took out of her po pocket a small handwriting paper in German, with a curious figure on the cover, a unicorn, handed to me, pointed, pointed smiling at the website, written on the paper, and left. Uh, this is the, the paper he handed me. <laughs> yeah, in your hands. Um, with my humble German, I understood something about living in a difficult world, and that we need to help each other and stay healthy. And her marketing strategy worked because uh, uh, I was like immediately searched for the website. <laughs> um, and this, this is what I found, the website. No, no unfortunately not <laughs> this one. Yes, this one. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, in Budapest, I don't know if you are aware, uh, some important far right conferences are happening in the next few days with some of uh, Marine Le Pen's main allies, uh, extremist parties from Belgium, Austria, and Spain, and influencers and Fox News journalists linked to Donald Trump. Um, the secretary of the Ministry of Women, Family, and Human Rights in Brazil, Angela Gandra, who is from a traditional family of Opus Dei, will also be in Budapest. Uh, on the agenda of the, one of the events, teams such as God, Country and Family, uh, in another debate, the, the matter is announced with a sentence, the man is a father, the mother is a woman. Meetings are also planned to talk about the fact that Western civilization is under attack. Uh, so going from small actions to powerful political and religious connections, disputes around the gender issues, women's sexual and reproductive rights, and LGBTQ plus rights are happening and getting stronger and articulated and straining their transnational connections. Um, and, that, and, and this is why we think that, that this cannot be seen anymore and as something um, alien to the other struggles, other important issues, uh, but on the contrary, this is something that needs to be seen as, uh, as um, intersectional to, to all subjects, um, because uh, it is intersectional to all subjects, capitalism, neoliberalism, by labor relations, institutional politics, uh, you know, these people in Budapest are powerful people who decides uh, public politics and decides laws and decides uh, our lives, basically. So, uh, to talk all, <laughs> to talk about all of this, I would like to invite my fellows to to speech. They they will speak like ten minutes for ten minutes, and then we uh, uh, go with the conversation with you. 
So Sonia uh, is going to start just saying a little words about Sonia. Since the late nine, uh, 70s, Sonia Correa has been involved in research and advocacy activities related to the gender equality, health and sexuality. Uh, she was the research coordinator for sexual and reproductive health and rights at Down Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, a global thought feminist network of which he is presently a board member. There is a long bio. <laughs> Sonia did a lot of important things. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think. And since 2002, she's a research associate at the Brazilian Inter Interdisciplinary Association for AIDS in Rio de Janeiro, where uh, with Richard Parker, she co-chairs the Sexuality Policy Watch Program, SPW, a global forum comprised of researchers and ac activists engaged, engaged in the analysis of global trends in sexuality related policy and politics. So... <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for the invitation, I would say the privilege, of being part of this whole feminist panel today. Uh, while preparing for the panel a few days ago, me, Island, Andrea, and Funda, Eva was not here yet. Uh, we saw, we converged in seeing this panel as a good opportunity to share information, analysis, ideas that may interrogate the wider shared perception or conception that the sad return of the religious, to use a famous Derrida formula, uh, is distinct, somehow distinct, and eventually less important <laughs> uh, than other structural trends fueling authoritarianism and de-democratization in the world today. After some back and forth and thinking about my contribution, I decided that the, the best I could do was to bring this to this conversation a sort of uh, bird's eye view or overview of anti-gender wars in the world today with a little bit of a historical perspective. And what I bring is uh, grounded or informed by both uh, experience <laughs> and research. As you have seen from the profile that uh, Andrea has given to you about me for quite a long time. <laughs> I have been involved in first battles with repoliticized religious forces around gender sexuality and abortion rights. And uh, within this bumpy trajectory, one important occasion was that I had the privilege of witnessing in 1995 at the UN what I called the eruption of the gender trouble of the Vatican. This was the road towards the Beijing conference. And as some may know, but maybe not everybody, this eruption led uh, to, the, um, to the production of the semantics or the device, the discursive device of gender ideology as the new face of Marxism, quite often, although not always, uh, by, that were crafted by ultra-Catholic authors, including a female, female authors, in plural. Mm -hmm. Before this content being sanitized and transported to theological literature at the Vatican itself. Yeah? Uh, after witnessing that, uh, since 2017, I have been fully engaged in studying the long-term political effects of this invention <laughs> and also examining its uh, gene genealogical uh, story, very convoluted story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's out of that that I'm going to bring this overview. As it's already settled in a quite vast literature today, available in books, in, in, in the internet as well, 
between 2012 and 2013, bottom-up and highly heterogeneous uh, anti-gender political mobilizations have erupted concomitantly in Europe and Latin America. Uh, in Europe, the starting point of that was the massive Manif Portu that used anti-gender theory discourses as a proxy to attack uh, same-sex marriage legislation. And this mobilization rapidly moved, started traveling across Europe. In Latin America, meanwhile in Spain, and this is not minor, the stream right Vox party was created and the ultra-Catholic NGO Astio Year also established its digital arm, which now operates globally, uh, mostly in Latin America, in the Americas and Europe, but also in Africa, for example. In the case of Latin America, those same years have witnessed um, the eruption of fierce attacks against gender and education in Paraguay, and in Brazil in the form of uh, an assault on gender and ideology in education. At the OAS assembly, which was in 2013, there was a big attack on a resolution on gender identity and sexual orientation. And that same year, the leftist president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, um, launched a full diatribe in his weekly TV program against the false science of gender. Mm -hmm. In my region, our region here, <laughs> three of us, uh, from 2016 onwards, these storms have intensified. I'm going to give you a very brief list of the most important events that happened. Mm -hmm. um, a big campaign took marches to the streets in Mexico against LGBT rights. A new attack on gender and education erupted in Peru, the famous campaign called Mis hijos no te metas. Uh, and most principally, anti-gender ideology was activated to, successively activated, in the referendum of the peace agreement in Colombia. Hmm? That was lost. Hmm? 2017, there, in 2017, there were many in, less relevant events, but I want to point out that this was when Judith Butler, who was visiting Brazil, was subject to a grotesque attack by these forces. Her effigy as a witch was burned in a public pro protest in Sao Paulo, which is a, a feudal manifestation of politics. Mm -hmm. And then we can shift to the year of 2018 that started with fierce attack against gender ideology in the Costa Rica presidential elections that almost led to the presidency a fundamentalist evangelical pastor. And the next step is the anti-gender ideology cyclone that has decidedly impacted in the Brazilian electoral catastrophe that led Bolsonaro to power. Hmm? Uh, today, gender ideology are its proxies. I'm thinking of Poland, LGBT ideology. I'm thinking of uh, trans ideology that is sprouting in many places. Um, is a sort of lingua franca that is shared and used by both religious voices and authoritarian leaders, uh, anti-democratic formations, and even fascist uh, figures. Mm -hmm. This maze uh, links Putin, for example, with Latin America right-wing libertarians like Javier Milei in Argentina. It links urban policies or ordo iuris, uh, uh, events, publications, and deployments to what is happening in North American state level politics, attacks on LGBT rights in education, or even attacks on race, racial critical theory. Hmm? Uh, it connects Mexican bishops to sub Saharan African politicians that are abolishing 
sexuality education in schools or attacking LGBT rights. Or the declarations of the Pope of Francis against gender with what some left-wing candidates in Brazil have used in the last municipal elections of 2020. Uh, though gender formations as such are not present in the same manner in non-Christian countries, here I'm thinking of Islamic countries or India, uh, it should be said that at the UN level since 1990, Islamic states have aligned themselves with other states that attack gender, as for example, Russia in the past, and now also Hungary, Poland, Brazil, the United States when Trump was there. Uh, as David Paternot, who has studied anti-gender anti politics in Europe, has insightfully said, gender ideology is like a Frankenstein that has escaped the original laboratory of its creator, the Vatican, and, ha and has gained its own life. It's everywhere. This mutation is consistent with the very heterogeneous and metamorphic features of anti-gender formations operating at national levels. Uh, I call these formations, I name these formations hydras because they have many heads that move in very different and even contradictory directions that make for us very difficult to grasp what they are. In Brazil and Latin America, by and large, they count with the core of religious forces usually composed by ultra-Catholic uh, groups and figures and evangelical fundamentalists, around which a wide range of secular or apparently secular actors orbit. Politicians, members of professional associations, businessmen, neoliberal think tanks, but also openly fascist groups. And in the, and, and in the case of Brazil, uh, we have also the Jewish right, and the military. Uh, these anti-gender crusades have many targets. Certainly feminist is the first target, but the main goal is really, in my view, is really the political order itself. And this can be seen in my own country where what happened in the election and before the 2018 election is now transported to the state apparatus, mostly in terms of policy frames adopted in the human rights, women, family, and human rights ministry, education, and foreign affairs. This statization of anti-gender ideology is also deployed in grotesque speech as acts and gestures of state authorities, including Bolsonaro himself, and perhaps more importantly, the highly heterogeneous religious and secular configuration of anti-gender politics in Brazil is embodied in the ministerial figures. Because we had a female pastor, a fundamentalist evangelical minister. Her secretary is Angela Gandra, that Andrea has mentioned, who is a known member of Opus Dei. We can, and Angela Gandra mimics Kathleen Novak, the current president of Hungary, who was the minister of women's affairs, including because she's a sort of shadow chancellor doing external policy in the domain of the right and conservative um, policies. And the ex-pastor minister of education that was mentioned in a panel two days ago that brandished the Bible in official speeches is also to be taken into this picture. As noted by anthropologist Isabella Khalil, my working partner, together with the ultra-neoliberal Minister of the Economy, Paulo Guedes, these religious figures of the government compose the sort of a dual face of the current Brazilian governmentality. This articulation was in fact made explicit by Angela Gandra, when she wrote that investing in families is the best way to cut the costs of the welfare state. Uh, to conclude, I just want to add that when we look 
at the complex genealogies of anti-gender formations and their connections with right-wing assemblages and historical threats that link between the politics of the religious and right-wing politics is also becomes very evident. And although I had more to say, I don't have time, I just want to underline that in that respect that for us who inhabited the Latino world of uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Latin America, in that respect, we can do not forget that historical fascism in our context was directly linked to ultra-Catholicism. The best example is phalangismo in Spain, which is, was directly connected to the creation of Opus Dei, who, which remains active today, and that makes a link also with Vox, Asteroir, Citizen Go, all the forces we have been talking about. And my own genealogical excavations also suggest that Brazilian Catholic-inspired integralismo may have also contributed to the present ideological spirals of neo-fascists that combine both secular and religious forces and connect with the authoritarian nature of neoliberalism. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, I'm going to pass to Eileen, Eileen Torres Santana, completed her PhD in social science with a major in history at the Latin American Faculty of Social Science. She originally studied psychology and communications in Havana, Cuba, and was a researcher at the Cuban Institute of Cultural Research, Juan Marinello. She also worked as a guest professor at the University of Havana, Flaxo, Ecuador, the University of Barcelona, and the University of Massachusetts. Her research topics are feminism, gender studies, as well as inequalities and citizenship in Latin America. She has also published articles in a variety of journals and contribu contributed chapters to several books. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm part of the IRGAG group. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, many thanks to all of you for for being here in this summer day. I'm really happy to be here. It is an honor uh, also for your presence, and, and I will go straight to the to the point. So I would like to start by going by going back four days ago on the first day of our conference, in our very first debate, most of the presenters mentioned more or less indirectly something that I'm interested in taking up again here in one of our last sessions. At some point um, in that first conversation, uh, two questions came up. First, if all authoritarianism is conservative, and second, if all conservatism is authoritarian. In the subsequent sections, in one way or another, these questions have been in the background of um, some discussions. We have talked about neoliberalism and authoritarianism, about authoritarian neoliberalism, and so on. I believe that one of the most important focuses of this panel is to take up these issues directly and advance discussions on why and in what sense it's absolutely essential to recognize the fundamental alliance between authoritarianism, authoritarian neoliberalism, and conservatism. So, why can't we talk about authoritarianism today without making that link and somehow why, why is there so little 
for us caught in discussion about, about it and when we talk about other issues like the ones we have been discussing during these days. Perhaps these analyses and these questions uh, will help us think about something that also came out in the first debate and in others. I refer to the explanation of the political right in terms of irrationality. For example, is it irrational that Bolsonaro and other political leaders have opposed vaccines? Is the popular vote for the extreme right irrational? Is the presidential solution of Janine Agnes in Bolivia irrational to face the pandemic with, with fasting and prey? It is irrational that when Bolsonaro and Trump met in uh, 2019 among, among all global uh, politics, one of the cores of that, that conversation was the need to fight against gender ideology. Is irrationality what explains all this or should we go, should we go uh, one step further? What I want to do in these minutes is to advance a little uh, on these questions, although I think that the most important thing is to leave those questions raised. I have four general points that I want to state, and then we can go deeper into them. First, we cannot think today of the political right without thinking on the field of neoconservative movements within which religiously based neoconservatism have a main force. Authoritarianism, fascism, and contemporary neoliberalism, whatever we are going to call it, have profound assemblages with religious neoconservatism. Second, sexual and gender politics are at the forefront of current discussions of democracy, unlike in previous decades. Gender has become a kind of symbolic glue, like some scholars um, have called it, and that encompasses disputes about democracy in general and not just about uh, ident identity politics. Third, the assemblages between authoritarian neoliberalism and neoconservatism allow us to advance in a deeper and more informed discussion about what authoritarian fermentation from below is and how it is produced. In other words, where is authoritarianism beyond the government programs? It also allows us to think about global politics and its connection and how, for, for example, Putin's politics of traditional values is key to understanding the Ukraine war. And fourth, the analysis of this plot shows how and in what senses sexual and gender politics articulates broader political processes and helps understand the place that anti-feminist occupies, occupies within contemporary politics. When we analyze the relationship between the political right and specifically authoritarian neoliberalism, we can do so from different pers perspectives. We can ask ourselves the important question of who are the neoconservatives? Um, are they politicians, religious leaders, businessmen, all that together? We may wonder where they are, in the churches only, in all the churches, the churches, or in some? Are they in, in our political parties? Are they in, for example, the Organization of American States, in the international organizations? Are they in the political institutions or no? We can wonder about their strategies. What are these strategies? Are they in the same as always? Is there anything new? We can also ask ourselves about their alliances or fractures. Neoconservatives are evangelicals, Catholical, ca Catholics. The historical dispute between evangelicals and Catholics is maintained or not, and why does it matter? And we can also ask about its impacts, right? We could delve into what they have achieved, change rules, norms, create new, neutralize popular politics, change coordinates and election results, occupy international political places. 
all of this is super important and much progress has been made in the discussion in the last almost uh, 10 years. In Latin America, which is the context where I work and know the most, we have a dense field of debate that addresses these questions. With the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, we have published a book on this, which includes 11 national and regional uh, case studies. And Sonia has coordinated a similar analysis effort that already has two editions. However, in these uh, remaining minutes, uh, I'm going to, to do well on addressing a different question, which may be more necessarily in the discussion of this conference. I will refer specifically to the question on if the connection between the authoritarian neoliberal right wing and the religious neoconservatism are mere similarities or related phenomena. That question could also have different inputs to be answered. In my analysis in this regard, I have ident identified some political fields which are at the same time discursive, strategic, institutional, and moral that show this connection. I mean the connection between authoritarian neoliberalism and religious neoconservatism. Through them, what I'm interested in arguing is that this, connect, this connection is neither contingent, contingent or spasmodic. On the contrary, authoritarian neoliberalism and neoconservatism have a consubstantial relationship. I'm going just to mention six of those assemblages. There are more, but I have chosen those six to present here and ask you to think about what that has to do with what we have discussed in the previous session and what my colleagues here uh, are arguing. So six of the plays of encounters between neoliberalism and conservatism are fair. First, their anti-progressivism and anti-communism rhetoric. Second, their kind of reverse anti-colonialism I, we can talk uh, more about that later. Third, uh, their narrative um, about the, the, the issue of insecurity, violence, and war. Fourth, the gender ideology issue. Sonia, I've talked about that. Five, the, uh, all the narrative and political strategy around family and education. And six, the big question of freedom, what freedom is. Okay. The neoliberal program, as well as the directly neoconservative religious really one, are found in each of these political places and programs and produce complex platforms of politicization that Russia Rational, rationally and not irrationally, produce concrete policies and wide-ranging conflicts that have everything to do with democracy in its broader, broadest sense. Unfortunately, and um, I cannot go further in the explaining of the contents of these assemblages, we, we, we can talk about in a minute, but I encourage you to, to ask me about any of them in the Q and, and, and A um, section. Finally, and although the epistemological scene around gender constitutes an open battlefield in the discussion of right-wing polit politics, the analysis can and must go further. And that's because neoconservative religious politics has expanded along the spectrum of the political left and it's mandatory to, to consider that um, issue. In the Latin American case, the national pathways of progressivism were and are deeply uh, discontinuous. There are many examples of advances in rights and at the same time of neoconservative expansion during the preeminence of progressive governments at the beginning of the, of the century, for example, um, at the beginning of his administration, the former Ecuadorian president, Rafael Correa, Sonia mentioned that, supported an explicit decolonial agenda of 
LGTB uh, IQ plus rights. And at the same time, he ignored women's rights and did not uh, hide his misogyny. It was also in Ecuador where gender ideology uh, was installed in political discourse. The same happened in Bolivia, and we can uh, go analyzing all the, all, all the countries. Therefore, um, although the turn to the right has implied a kind of backlash, I, I will talk about the backlash uh, device later, but although the turn to the right has implied a kind of backlash for policies in favor um, of the rights of women and LGBTQ plus people, we cannot disregard that the political leftists in power maintained a conflictive relationship and certain restrictive issues drawing from feminist agendas. And religious neoconservatism are today present in all political regimes, even in Cuba, by the way, which is a country that normally presents itself as an outsider in this discussion. So all this complexity requires difficult and accurate analysis of what we now see as a broader course of de-democratization, as Sonia said, and uh, the analysis of religious neoconservatives and their back and forth ties with myriad, myriad political forces plays a central role in our discuss discussion. And that's the reason why criticism from the popular camps and feminist and LGBTQ politics must be anti-neoliberally anti-neoliberal, but also and very firmly anti-neoconservative so far. Thank you, Eileen. Now I'm uh, going to pass the microphone to Funda Hulagu. Funda is an independent researcher and adjunct lecturer at the University of Marburg. She is the author of Policy Reform in, Tur in Turkey, Human Security, Gender and State Violence under, under Erdogan, and co-edited Turkey's New State in the, Mar in the Making, Transformations in Legality, Economy and Coercion. So is it? Yeah. yeah. So okay, I would like to thank also for your welcome for, for your welcoming presence here and for the invitation to the Luxembourg Foundation. So I will just start with the presentation so that we don't lose much time. Um, I will be touching a sensitive and difficult topic today. Well, at least for me, it is difficult to touch on. I, I actually speaking, but my question is also about anti-feminism, what has political Islam to do with it? So how to make sense of the relation of political Islam and anti-feminism, especially in this latest phase? Historically speaking, we, we can just concur a lot of commonalities in between, but I will not go into the details of this historical genealogy. So, um, okay, I will also start by referring to the initial discussion, which is also the reason why we are here together. We are trying to make sense of authoritarianism and the rise of it. And there is a discussion mainly in between two positions. There are those who argue that, well, we are going through a hegemonic crisis because of neoliberalism. And others who could argue that, no, hegemony is all intact and we are living a fascistic turn because of neoliberalism as a logical continu continuation of neoliberalism, not against it, not as a response to it. So we have two positions. Um, notwithstanding um, many important points they come, they bring with themselves, notwithstanding the different levels of analysis they bring with themselves. I want to a little bit shift the focus and ask another question. Because if the point, if the issue is not about the balance between consent and coercion today, but if we have something else, and if we have rather a meta-ideological meta crisis, what I hear from the notion of meta-ideology is this, basically. The ability to have certain solutions to social contradictions. Whether they really resolutely solve these social contradictions doesn't matter. A meta-ideology meta has a 
claim, claim to deal with social contradictions. So therefore, if the issue is not at the level of consent building, but rather ideational generation, what I mean by that basically? I mean that, and I, I think that, um, anti-feminism it's in its relation to political Islam works as a substitute ideology not only to fight against the rise of women's movements, actually speaking, of course, it's an important part, it's inevitable, the objective condition is this, but also to revitalize political Islamism, which aspires to become a meta-ideology. So in other words, I argue that anti-feminism helps political Islamists to reproduce themselves, not only to fight against the opposition. How come? I will try to give under uh, three basic examples or modalities of this. So first, they try to, with the help of anti-feminism, political Islamists, of course, basically I'm referring to Turkey, but we can include also many other countries from the Middle East, especially Egypt, I would say, try to update Islamic orthodoxy, Islamist orthodoxy. What I mean by that? Basically, they argue that Especially within their basis, within the basis of political, Islam, political Islamism in Turkey, those who are voting for AKP, but also not only voters, they are who are believers, true believers of the idea that we, we should have an Islamic society. There is a change, there is a, there is a new development. Most of those who are, especially most of those who are women, who are believing in the cause of political Islam, have taken a new road. They, they switch the belief from post-secular, from Islamism to post-secularism. So instead of a strict relation to the Islam as such, as in the orthodoxy, now we see the rise of a spiritualism combined with Islamism, spiritualism beyond Islamism, like combining uh, Buddhism and Islam, like having secular tendencies within Islamism. Of course, this creates a gender panic within the political Islamists who are more prone for more orthodox forms. And anti-feminism helps to reestablish, restore orthodoxy in some sense for within those who are within still this camp, within the camp of political Islamists. And the, the argument is this, because those women, those young Muslim women, let me say, if they don't, how they call themselves, I don't know, but let me say these young Muslim women, they are aspiring for gender equality, full sense. They are questioning, for example, forms of fatherhood in Turkey. How come that fathers are not careful for their children? Why we should only take care of as mothers? So they're questioning many things. And as a, in a position to this, political Islam uses anti-feminism to argue that, well, look, gender equality doesn't function because it is against the divide divine creation, and the divine creation gives us different roles. Look, I will, um, and the political Islamists tell, okay, we will, we will deal with these men, these quote-unquote barbaric men, we will educate them, but please accept your role, accept your divine position. So you see, they are not directly opposing those women, they say that there will be a reform, because normally those men are quote-unquote bar barbaric, still they need some education, they need to learn Islamic morality, but wait for it. In the meantime, please forget about gender equality. Second, this is the most, I think, problematic part of anti-feminism in Turkey, but also in the region, norm-breaking. Um, and this norm-breaking is very important to make sense because it shows how this is an ideological issue and not a discursive strategy only. What I mean by that, um, in Turkey, but also in the region, you, you have seen probably, and many of you well, know very well, the rise of Kurdish women's movement, and especially the rise of the Kurdish peace movement, um, uphold by women, many Kurdish women, but also not only Kurdish women, also Turkish women who are supporters. And the basic idea of Kurdish feminism in Turkey against the Erdogan regime, but also in the region against ISIS, is if you remember, um, was that, well, gender difference matters because gender difference brings, like, uh, not in, uh, gender difference brings women's standpoint, which is pacifist, which is against war. And in order to break this norm, very clearly, very, uh, how would I say, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a tactic which works, unfortunately, 
um, political Islamists argue, if you go for gender difference, why you don't take buy-in gender complementarity? Because we say the similar thing. We, see that, we think that, yes, women have a different destiny, women have a different position and a, a different voice, and they should fulfill it. So if you argue as a feminist that there is gender difference, then why not gender complementarity? So they are trying to break the Kurdish peace movement, women's movement, for example, by another um, input, anti-feminist input. And the third, they try to give form. What I mean by that, as I told you in the first one, but this third one is very important to make sense because in Turkey there is a feminicide. The rates of feminicide is very high. And we cannot assume that political Islamists are doing fine with this fact. They are wanting it, no. Because feminicide in Turkey is breaking up the patriarchal contract between the state and woman. Women are not happy with the fact that they are killed every day, and even if they are voting for AKP. And women are divorcing. Women are quitting their families. This is a social fact. Social depletion is real in Turkey. As a matter of fact, political Islamists cannot say, okay, whatever, this is the fault of women who are not obeying their husband. No, they don't say so. This is very clever on their side, unfortunately. They argue that, okay, Punishing men is not the real strategy. We will not punish men. So this is the clever side because they try to buy in the uh, allegiance of men voters. We will not punish men. We will reduce the legal punishment rates. We will not try to police them. So this is also a strategy to, of course, buy them in. But we will teach them how to be a good man, how to be a good husband, how to be a good father. So in that respect, they try to create, give form to a new quote-unquote respectful man, male citizen. Okay, all in all, what I wanted to uh, underline in this talk is that um, anti-feminism probably, like was the case for political Islam during the Cold War, communism worked for political Islam during the Cold War in Turkey as a way to reproduce themselves to consolidify themselves. Today, anti-feminism works like ersatz or substitute anti-communism for post-fascist post -fascist movements. And I think Islamism in its current form is a post-fascistic ideology in Turkey. And, but we should not assume that the rise of post-fascism is a success. On the contrary, what happens, I guess, as in the case of political Islam, there's a true crisis. They try to deal with it. So what we see, the rise of neoconservatism or far right is not the rise of it. It's just not the rebirth of them from their ashes, but a true crisis. It is a true crisis because they're concurrents. So the, 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 the concurrent ideologies are also in crisis. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sonda. And now, uh, Dr. Eva Majeska. Dr. Professor Eva Majeska <laughs> is a feminist philosopher and activist living in Warsaw. She taught at the UDK Berlin, University of Warsaw, and the University in Krakow, Poland. She was also a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, ICI Berlin, and EWM in Vienna. She published one book in English, Feminist Antifascism, Con uh, Counterpublics of the Common, and four books in Polish as well, and 50 articles and essays um, in journals, magazines, and collected volumes, including Iflux, Science, Third Text, Journal of Utopian Studies, and Jacobin. She, um, her cu current research is in Hegel's philosophy, focusing on the dialectics and the weak, feminist critical theory, and anti-fascist cultures. Thank you so very much for this introduction. Thank you very much to the organizers for making it possible. And thank you everybody who is here with us for being here with us and for listening to those very 
I would say, very fantastic presentations, but also on very sad topics. So I'm thinking that we are performing a sort of exercise of, of self-torture in some way. So we do it for good cause. That's uh, the optimist part of it. And uh, may I quote Rosa Luxemburg in the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for the first time today. Um, um, a sense of despair, a sense of fatigue is a luxury that is only available to those who do not have to struggle on daily basis. So basically, if you ever feel tired or exhausted, think about that, that it's actually impossible if you have to struggle fascism, if you have to struggle neoliberal economic oppression, if you have to combat um, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and all other diseases of, of today's culture, I would say that you know the, the exhaustion is a natural element. And obviously, I don't deny its existence and the necessity to face it. But also, on the other hand, we have to think of the probably impossibility of stopping it right now, especially in the moment when all these right-wing fundamentalist uh, authoritarian currents are not only international, which is actually a slap to our faces. We are sitting in Rosa Luxemburg Foundation that has as aim to build internationalism, that follows the legacy of Rosa Luxemburg, one of the most famous, most important internationalists of this world. And yet what we are talking about here is the international of the right-wing fundamentalists. Hmm? That's really not a pleasant moment. And also the second point I would like to make in the beginning of the presentation is that perhaps after hearing the amazing previous uh, presentations and also after hearing what I will say later, we might all try to think about the centrality of anti-genderism, the centrality of misogyny and transphobia and gender fear, basically, the centrality of it in today's fascism and in, in today's politics more generally. So I like since a couple of years, I like to, to, to show to the discussants with, which, with whom I, I have the honor to, to, to discuss, the recent change in the constellation, let's say, of political sciences, political practice, and political theory as well, which basically shifted from the moments, the times, when feminism was somewhere on the margins or even beyond the margins of political debates. So we had politics here and feminism somewhere on the outskirts. And today, feminism is as the core, whether we like it or not. I like it, but many of my anti-fascist friends are deeply troubled by the fact that now, today, they actually have to face gender issues and the LGBTQ struggles and the reproduction politics and care labor and affective labor and all those issues that for so many decades have been conveniently externalized to the labor of uh, the, the hard labor of, of people like ourselves. So feminist uh, scholars and, and uh, practitioners, theorists, um, uh, activists, etc., etc. So this shift and the centrality of the feminist agenda in today's politics made me write the book that you mentioned, The Feminist Antifascism. So I should have written actually Antifascism as Feminism or There is No <laughs> Antifascism. And recently I had a, an occasion to discuss with Paul Mason who published a, a book about fascism and antifascism. I believe last year was the publication. And this amazing British uh, scholar and activist uh, against fascism still continued to build anti-fascism somehow apart or away from the gender problematic and the gender topics. So suddenly I had to face this, this difficult moment of being on one hand, you know, uh, difficult and on the other hand, perhaps also having some uh, uh, title to, to do it. I asked, is your anti-fascism only for boys? You know, how can an immigrant worker, for instance, with five children who is cleaning your house, how can she join into this anti-fascism? Is there, what are the conditions of possibility of doing that? So basically, I'm thinking that all the information, so basically in Poland, it's the same. I would, <laughs> perhaps not in the version with Islam, because Islam is not a popular religion in Poland, but uh, Catholicism is overpowering, the, is, is taking over everything, basically. After the 1989 transformation, we've had the takeover by church. The church took property, often claimed property that never belonged to it before the Second World War. So they, they basically took over everything. And also the presence of Opus Dei, of, of Ordo Iuris, and these fundamentalist organizations that um, our first speaker mentioned um, already is omnipresent. So my uh, professorial struggle was made difficult by precisely fundamentalists for, from this organization. And I want to mention two very amazing colleagues of mine, Elżbieta Korolczuk and Agnieszka Graf, who recently published a book called Anti-Gender Politics. And then there is a subtitle that I don't remember. It was published with Rutledge, so you can find it very easily. And this analysis precisely 
presents the internet, the, the, the today's authoritarianism as fundamentalism and as international force. So the same forces that act in Russia, let me remind you that in 2012, Russian parliament, the Duma, has made domestic violence not a crime. They've erased it from penal code. So you can batter your wife legitimately in Russia, basically, since 2012. Also around 2012, they pronounced the, what they called LGBT um, ideology illegal. So therefore, you cannot publicly speak about LGBTQ anything because you might be accused of spreading LGBTQ um, ideology. And the very same Putin is sponsoring, obviously, and this has been proven by many authors, including Elżbieta Korolczuk and Agnieszka Graf, but also plenty of other authors. He and other fundamentalists globally have been sponsoring organizations that have one sole aim to, I would say, to reopen the way towards fascism by means of anti-genderism. So I would say that anti-genderism is a convenient etiquette that allows to bring back fascist political tendencies. And what I mean by fascist political tendencies? The fascist political tendencies, I usually diagnose them following the um, extremely troublesome philosophical legacy of Karl Schmitt, who was the political and theoretical architect of the Third Reich, nonetheless. So, first of all, the sovereign power has to be over the rule of law and yet have the capacity to create law. So the sovereign, the authoritarian sovereign in Karl Schmitt's ideology is basically somebody who can create laws, but who is exempt of it, which requires an excessive, excessive uh, power uh, position of the executive state powers and the diminishing, which happens in Poland today, this is our political process, the diminishing of legislative and juridical powers uh, and also making the courts and the juridical power directly dependent on the executive. So these are the steps. If you observe these steps in your country, you see that there is fascism, but at the same time, or at least the risk of it, at the same time, the anti-gender politics, so basically taking direct control over women's bodies and reproductive capacities. Today we can speak of women and other persons capable of reproductive um, uh, uh, labor, obviously. Um, so the sudden interest in women's bodies and control over women's bodies, which in Poland had the expression, unfamous expression of strengthening the ban on abortion. So today, basically, if you are a victim of rape, you might get an abortion, but it's not very certain because the procedure to getting to that is so difficult that actually for many women, it is easier to go to Germany or Czech Republic or wherever else than to perform abortion in Poland. So the criminalization of abortion is actually a performance of another very important element of Karl Schmitt fascist politics, which is a creation of an alien or an enemy to stripe from laws, from rights, from possessions, from um, significance, from titles, if you can, but also later from life. So obviously the Jewish population in 1930s and 40s was the other and the enemy of, uh, of, of the political right wing in Germany and in other fascist states as well. But then today, women in Poland, women are suffering the same fate. Basically, we, we have become this convenient other to stripe of all kinds of rights, positions, etc. Because it is not only the ban on abortion that happened in the last years. It is also, for instance, a significant change in the procedure of medical treatment. So beforehand, it was the woman patient who had the last say over what kind of procedures are going to be taken in the medical context of reproductive health. And today it is the doctor. So this shift, it's minor. You know, it wasn't even a voted by the parliament. It was a shift in ministerial executive politics. So again, I'm showing to you how different things have moved from parliamentary, where you can observe it, when there is 460 people to the debate, so it's a process, so the public can be much better informed about everything. And now it happens basically in the ministerial cabinet somewhere. And then out of the blue, you see women deprived of another option of controlling our bodies, right? So. The, the um, abortion law uh, and the abortion ban is the main context for women in Poland to suffer from fascist politics, but there is also the LGBTQ population. So what happened with the LGBTQ people is even more disturbing and even more interesting at the same time. Since 2019, the so-called zones free, LGBTQ free zones, basically this was the name, 
were created in different regions in Poland. What it means? It means that the local governments, so it could be municipality, it could be regional uh, parliament, it could be a rural community even, they were voting, unfortunately often for, regulations that would exclude the possibility of publicly speaking of the LGBTQ people or that they were emphasizing the sacred matrimonial tie of marriage and traditional family to such an extent that obviously as a consequence, the sexual minorities would be excluded or further discriminated, etc. So there are two versions of these anti-LGBT uh, uh, regulations and uh, my colleagues from the Atlas of Hate, you can find it online, it's Atlas of Hate. So, so there is a website which documents on those zones. And luckily those brave people have documented those zones because if they didn't, we wouldn't notice how vast of a territory these zones were covering. Because if you hear some local government somewhere passed a law, you think, okay, it's, it's somewhere. But then it started to be like raindrops, basically, you know, heavy rain. So, so these people, the, the Atlas of Hate um, authors, started to document, and one third, 35% of Poland's territory, suddenly became covered with different versions of these homophobic uh, laws. The interesting thing, however, is that these are not really laws. Why? Because they do not obey to the formal exigences of the Polish legal system. So sometimes the local government steps in the competences of the central government. Sometimes they, they break uh, European law in those documents. So these documents are laws that are no laws, are kind of fakes. You know, we have fake truths. So in Poland, we are in avant-garde as often <laughs> historically. So this time <laughs> we, we, we have the fake laws, basically the, the laws that make no sense whatsoever and which are now over, uh, overrun by different uh, uh, courts because they do not uh, uh, fit in the Polish legal system. However, laws were created. So for the population, we hear what it means. So for the LGBTQ, so we had a wave of suicides of especially trans and non-binary youth, young people. Yes. So, um, uh, so, so we had a wave of suicides. So therefore, it was it became extremely important to challenge those. Okay, I want to play a clip for to end my uh, to my uh, to, to end my presentation. So basically, just to to wrap up, uh, I'll be happy to discuss the strategies, etc. The clip is opening us to strategies already, and we can, if we can have sound, it will be fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's working great. I love it. <laughs> so I I have uh, more questions, but I think that because of we have not so much time, I will pass the microphone for you. You have questions. I see one hand already. Up.
Thanks a lot for really great presentations. Thank you. My question is mainly at Funda and then to everybody. I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking of a very different political Islam, a very low res resolution of political Islam in India because you're a minority, you know. And uh, I want to talk about like the, you know, the in that place, actually uh, how the mobility these right-wing ideologies are giving to women. You know, in India, both Hindu right and the Muslim right, Muslim fund, I would, I don't know what is the correct term, political Islam probably. Uh, the thing is, there is anyway, there is no sexual freedom, you know, like, you know, it's, uh, you have to be celibate, you have to be within marriage. So, uh, I mean, anyway, that's not there in the society. So if you cut that aspect, and if you want to have a little upper hand with everybody, you'll quote Quran and you'll fight with men using Quran. So that becomes like a way of, uh, like, you know, mobility for women, the same in the Hindu right also, you know, the, some of the even women even participate in the violence sometimes against the Muslim community. So that and BJP, which is a right wing party, has the highest amount of women participation. And this mobility in a very weird system it gives. And I just want to say one more thing about like, you know, when you talk from a less perspective, I come from a state which has like a small left government, which we, we call it the Communist Party of Kerala Limited. It has its own problems. But one of the things they tried was in a place like India, you can't really get rid of religion that, I mean, it's like well, it's something you breathe in and weave through. So what they started doing is the party will have its members in the mosque committee and the temple committee, and it made the temple committee and mosque committee a little tolerable, you know? So this was one strategy which was used. So, I mean, I don't know, what are the points of intervention within that? Or, I mean, sometimes to fight outside becomes like too difficult. I think we can make like rounds with three questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, so I'm a Russian journalist and I'll repeat some points that I made two days ago on my panel about far right politicians and, you know, because you kind of told about Putin's politics and things, it's just my comment. Uh, it's not a question, but I'd like to elaborate. So you see in Russia, they see feminism and LGBTQ as agents of Western uh, liberalism. And they call it, it's widely used in uh, Russian media, they call it gay Europe. So they saw Russian civilization as a uh, like last stand of true Christian civilization uh, to prevent uh, antichrist to come into this world. So they even uh, use a special word called katihon. It came from Greek, I think it's like that. I don't know if you have the same thing in Polish, uh, but they, yeah, they call it Katihon, and actually Katihon is the name of the far-right hub, uh, which is led by Alexander Dugin, you know, the far-right philosopher. Yeah, same, same, but not the same. <laughs> you see, it's, uh, I'd say Alexander Dugin is uh, far right, but he's not fascist. I'm, I'm really kind of, yeah, we see some fascist tendencies in Russia, but in the same time, it's not just like that. We can talk about, like, about it later. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say, Russia tries to lead this uh, black international thing, you know, the network of European far-right parties, think tanks and organizations. And of course, all of them are anti-feminists, anti-LGBTQ. And it's like they, they share all the same beliefs on that. And Russia, I mean, Russian far-right politicians, they try to see themselves as an avant-garde to oppose this to oppose the, you know, gay Europe, the, the, the feminism. And it's really easy to see in so Russia. So I believe media. that we need another Russian avant-garde, right? More in the tradition of like Malevich and other, would you agree that that would be a nice? No, of course, you know, I'm, I'm talking about far right avant-garde, but we don't have any other one way. That's why I'm sitting here. I believe, yeah, I believe that we have more questions perhaps, yeah. no? Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, two questions. First to Eileen, uh, if you can elaborate more about the platform that will lap the rational politics of conservatives and authoritarianism. 
so that you talk about. And then for Eva, uh, if you can give um, for us some context of the protest of the video that you share with us, uh, and if you can translate a little bit of the song, that it sounds great. <laughs> and uh, if you can share with us also uh, counter strategies in your country um, about all this politics of abuses. Thank you. Uh, we have three questions. You think you, I think we, we can start. No. Yeah, we can answer. And then we both yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah. Do I start? Yeah. Oh. Okay, thanks for the question. So, okay, yes, of course the context matters a lot. And uh, as I wasn't able to do a list of who, who I am referring to as political Islamists because it was a limited time. Of course, there is a difference of, first of all, there is a difference of, let me say, quote and quote, between elite Islamists and lay Islamists, Islamists who are anti-feminist. And um, elite, by elite, I refer mostly to the organic intellectuals of the regime who are also afraid of losing power, therefore use anti-feminism to restore their power. But there is also lay feminism. Men and women organized in small groups for, for the cause of anti-feminism. For example, the groups for um, divorced fathers groups, divorced and vulnerable fathers groups, divorced men and women groups. So there are lots of groups who are organized under platforms also, like um, um, divorced families groups, so and so forth, who are trying to attack feminists for, to receive certain privileges from the state. For example, they are really racketeering the state. They are sh doing a chantage to the state. They tell that if you cease to apply this law, for example, the law for alimony rights, if I, as a proletarian man, I am not anymore, um, I don't have to pay any fees to my divorced wife, then I will be there for the cause of Erdogan. So there is really, they are basically racketeering the state. They are just doing a chantage to the state. So therefore, at this point, I cannot say that this is full-fledged Islamism. This is a kind of pragmatic adaptation of Islamism for the cause of acquiring certain privileges from the state, in that sense. However, on the other hand, there is something interesting to underline also. Is I, I didn't have time also. Those women who are at, um, mobilized for the cause of anti-feminism in Turkey, interestingly, apart from a couple of um, Islamist uh, women in the inter Islamist intellectuals, the rest are coming from nationalist background. Nationalist secular women who are professionals and who are professionals who are lawyers, who are lawyers in the field of family uh, law, who are lawyers for, for divorce, who are meditating divorce courts and so on and so forth. So therefore, although I tried to underline the role of political Islam today, the story of course is not only political Islam and there's a great part of it about this pragmatism, the envy to acquire not only state power but also market power, the envy to get a market share. Um, so this part is also very important. Um, about the strategies, there are lots of things to say I'm not in the position to say if uh, we should uh, fight for mosques or not. I'm sure there are some Muslim women who are doing that. I, I wouldn't do, I cannot do this for me, for myself. I, I, I am not, uh, well, in that field. But the problem is deep in Turkey in the sense that the idea, so if we go back to this level of counter ideologies and ideologies, the problem is that how secularism as an ideology will reproduce itself how secularism will be able to tell to the working class woman that we are there for you and like secular ideology helps you. Because in Turkey, basically speaking, if you, have, you are a woman with, with, with a couple of children, there is no public system for, for um, kindergartens. And if you are poor, you can maybe find an Islamist sect, an Islamist group to look after your child. Basically speaking, this is the case. Then. There, is, there are like concrete problems, but also then these concrete problems are tied also to the ideological level because secularists are not defending also the secular, so and so forth. Yeah, I will leave it at that. 
Okay, so I'm going to slightly change the topic because the question was about strategy. So also uh, following the remarks of the Russian colleague uh, from, from five minutes ago, I believe that we, what we started in Poland was a kind of revision of the avant-garde means of artistic production also, so representation. So basically this was an important shift within the strategies of organizing, coordinating, and also spreading the feminist movement. A very interesting person, uh, Goha Adamczyk, uh, graphic designer, but also a member of Socialist, Socialist par uh, Party Razem. She made this very interesting, uh, she had this very interesting idea of collecting the black and white pictures of women who support women's rights protests in 2016 online, on one uh, page on the social media. And the response was overwhelming. It was 205 to 250,000 of black and white selfie pictures, you know, with somebody's face, body, whatever, group of people sometimes, and the hashtag black protest. So the hashtag that you've seen on the end of the, of the clip, Czarny protest, is black protest, and black protest was the name of the protests in 2016, because women decided to come to the streets wearing black. And also wearing black in work, in school, in university, everybody, every, everywhere, was a sign that somebody is in solidarity with the protest. So even if they couldn't go on strike and uh, come to the streets, wearing black meant that they are with the women's rights. So this, um, those means, but what, what I'm trying to point to is that those means were very simple. Wearing black or putting a selfie on the website, it's, it's something that many of us do every day. So therefore, th this strategy did not require bravery, heroism, exceptional skills of political agency or whatever else. They were very ordinary. So I'm taking this as a good example and as a good and important element of a shift in the strategy in this sense that before 2016, feminism was rather elitary, I must say. I regret it. I've, I'm a feminist in Poland since 20 something years. But we didn't reach out to too many people, while in 2016, suddenly, those invitations to take action via internet with the pictures, via you know a certain dress code, made it possible for women who were never engaged politically to make this first step. So then, when we had the massive street demonstrations, it was much easier to make the second step. And later, so I launched this as a sort of hypothesis, but then my sociologist friends checked it with actual data and actual interviews, so it was confirmed that this works. So basically, one of the strategies was to use new means of participation that were not exclusive, that were not exceptional, but that were making it for many, many new women, new people to participate. Also, what is, you know, as philosopher, I look at it from, from, from that perspective as well. So this was a shift also in our understanding of political agency that went in line with the revalorization of care and affective labor. So on one hand, within feminist theory and feminist discussion, we have the revalorization of the caring, of the relations, you know, the criticism of individualism and neoliberal individualism in particular. And then on the other hand, we try to apply means of production of our protests, let's put it this way, that are more available that are more flattened in terms of hierarchies, et cetera, et cetera. And so therefore, there is a shift in the understanding of the, of the political agency that is very important. And I think this is one of our responses. And politically, it plays very nicely against the fascist, exceptionally heroic narrative that our government is launching. So while Kaczynski and his government are speaking about we got to sacrifice for Europe, for conservatism, for God, for our countryside, homeland, et cetera, what feminist response is, is basically, and we just want to be together. This togetherness is very important. We are the country where the movement of, called Solidarity has been created in 1980. So therefore, there is this legacy, which was very exclusive for women in some uh, in, in, in the further years. So now the, the women decided to produce Solidarity, but now in the more flattened, more ordinary way. So basically, when I speak of the counterpublics of the common, I mean, obviously, the common as in Negri and Hart and in Spinoza, but also, I mean, the common as in emphasizing the ordinarity the um, um, resignation from certain hierarchies, the effort to sort of equ ega for egalitarianism also in our own ranks and structures. So this would be the strategy. So the strategies were simple, were street protests, obviously, were building also the international connections with our colleagues in Argentina, in Mexico. So the international women's strike which you probably have heard of in the context of US America, was actually something that began between Warsaw and Poland and Mexico and Argentina, and later also Brazil and Nicaragua. So this was the, and South Korea. Interestingly, they even had the same slogan as, as us. So they had black protests in support of women's rights in Seoul. 
So, so we were, so another thing was to try to build the feminist international because if there is no international, we can perhaps jump in the ranks. So here we're also seeing the kind of centrality of feminism within mo more broadly understood progressive politics. And the translation, the main words that were in the, uh, in the song were, you will not burn us all. <laughs> which uh, sort of plays with what Sonia was talking about, the witch burns, etc. And obviously our inspirations were also, I don't know, Judith Butler's uh, precarity, vulnerability, and all these issues of emphasis of the subjects to be, uh, you know, searching for uh, the solidarity and help. So in this moment of desperation, you're more eager to, uh, to avoid isolation and to build common collective structures. So it was definitely some versions of collectivism. It was all kinds of solidarity and strike theories and practices. So we looked at Icelandic women from 1975, I think they made the general strike of women and they refused to do all the housework and effective labor um, in support for their political rights. So this, is, this was one of the inspiration, but also 1980, uh, you know, shipyard of Gdańsk and Poland and looking at the, you know, we will not leave some colleague who was um, fired from her work alone. We will be with them. So basically, um, in the demonstrations, for instance, it was fantastic when you had different generations also of women speaking of being together. So of coming, uh, sorry. Okay, I'll talk later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, before I uh, answer, uh, I would like to actually extend this question about counter strategies for all of you. I think it's important. Thank you. First, I would like to, to make a comment uh, in relation with the Western issue, uh, because in fact, it's the same in Latin America. I mean, it's the, the same argument in the Western world. <laughs> and it allows me to, to explain more one of the assemblages I mentioned related to this reversed anti-colonialism. Uh, for example, we can observe in the case of Latin America, but all around the world, this convergence between authoritarian neoliberal, neoliberal rights and religious neoconservatism in what some scholars have called reverse anti-colonialist rhetoric, where gender issues are, are central. And this narrative argued that the gender agenda is anachronistic you know, with respect to national values and that it responds to foreign powers attempts to recolonialize uh, Latin America. In Costa Rica, for example, the ultra conservative candidates, uh, candidates of evangelical pastor uh, Fabricio Alvarado in 2018 presidential elections polarized the campaign with his rejection of same-sex same -sex marriage while denouncing the country's subject, subjection to international organizations and, and norms. In the recent platform of explicit convergence in this regard is the well-known Geneva Consensus. I, I suppose you, you, you know what I'm talking about, launched in October 2021, that has 36 signatory countries, including Brazil and Guatemala. Now and now Colombia, yeah. And this... Con this consensus, signed by ministers and senior government representatives, claims to protect the right to life and denies that there is any international right to abortion and uh, said uh, also that states have an international obligation to finance or facilitate uh, abortion. No? So its ideological line also um, affirms that sovereignty of nations, not exclusively to, to Latin America, and 
the, the not between traditional values, anti-rights, sexual and gender politics, and the, um, these so sovereignistic narratives is very important for the understanding on, on that issue. Um, and I'm thinking about the relationship between neoliberalism and neoconservatism on the basis of the six assemblages uh, that I spoke about. Sonia actually talked about one of them, which has to do with uh, the family, the family like a political um, space. And for example, for both neoliberalism and neoconservatism, the family is uh, at the same time a moral and economic unit. And in this sense, the privatization of the family serves both to justify the withdrawal of the state and to moralize relations um, in, in that space. No? I mean, the, the, the morality rooted in the heteropatriarchal uh, family is a vital, vital part of good order and is also an essential economic uh, unit. So the traditional family functions as a kind of a sort of Establisher and social controller. And that, that's very important for uh, the neoliberal, neoliberal um, politics. At the same time, for example, the question of violence uh, and insecurity is very important issue for both neoliberal and neoconservative actors. Securi securitization uh, policies, as well as those that have to do with social reproduction, monetary transfers, food stamps, and so on, are fundamental to ensuring the support and votes of women who are primarily responsible for sustaining life. So securitization also justifies xenophobic policies uh, which, of, of which women are of, often um, at the center. We have a lot of examples in Latin America of the links between uh, violence militarization, securitization of our states, and uh, the links with the um, xenophobic and anti-gender anti -gender politics. So, and, and in relation with the um, counter strategies, I think that, I think that we, have to, we have to start saying that feminist politics and LGBTQ plus politics have been uh, a, a key point for for the um, for obviously for for the institu institutionalization of of rights, and in some sense, uh, what neoconservatives uh, do is a reaction to that. One political device for for the understanding uh, understanding of that issue is the um, backlash. You know the understanding that what neoconservatives do is a kind of bad lash, uh, respect to the feminist and LGBTQ politics. And I think that uh, the bad lash device uh, explain an important part of this politics, but we need to, we need to consider that the neoconservative politics is, all, is not just a bad lash. No, in, in some senses is also prophylactic. No? They, they build contents, they promote politics, and they, they are not only reacting to the, what feminists do. And finally, um, I think that we have, as feminists, a, a lot of challenges in that, in that sense. One of them is that, uh, for example, the trans issue is a problematic content inside feminist actors and also is a, a, a kind of open uh, discussion and a, a, a very, very important issue for neoconservatives. Also, we, we need to consider that neoconservatism um, have appropriated the human rights discourse and also the feminist discourse, and we have to, to deal with that. And well, we can just. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, before um, reacting on the question of counter strategies or how to respond to all this, I want to also add a bit on, on the 
when what has been raised about Russia or Putin accusing gender ideology of being colonial, because it, I think it's very important to understand that this is not contextually specific to Russia. This is, this is a, a thread that runs across this, this lingua franca of gender ideology is playing everywhere. It's particularly compelling in Africa. I, I think it's probably the place where the use of the anti-colonial is, is more intense because it builds upon on very concrete, present anti-colonial sentiments. So it has an incredible capacity of mobilize the sentiment of both popular sectors, but also political elites against the, the, the neo-coloniality condition of African countries today. So it's a very smart. And in the case of Latin America, there are two things that I think it's important to underline. The first is that, regrettably enough, uh, the anti-colonial argument against gender is being quite often bought by left-wing sectors. Huh? I have heard and we have documented how left-wing politicians using that same language. Huh? So it, that is really very problematic. Huh? And in addition to finalize this topic, for me and, and to echo a conversation we had in the panel where there was uh, Pedro and Ricardo a few days ago, for me is really ironic that uh, an ideological device and a political strategy originally credited by the Catholic Church has the guts to accuse anybody of being colonial, okay? I mean, this is just turning upside down, and I think it's important to remark that, because the use of these discursive devices or straw men, as I have been saying, one key piece of that strategy is exactly to revert the, the sense and the meaning of the signifiers. Huh? So ideology is used to say that you are the ideologues. We are not ideologues. So you are the colonizers. We have nothing to do with that. It's a form of, of face washing, of, of political washing, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. As for counter strategies, I, I want to begin not with them, but with the obstacles. And pulling out something that Eva has, has brought to us, which is this evident sentiment of exhaustion, huh? of politically existing and thinking in a condition of survivalism under these autocratic regimes when they are in place, but also in the conditions of in intensified de-democratization uh, conditions or, or processes. And I'm saying that because I think that part is a, is a big obstacle for uh, construing strategies, particularly international and transnational strategies, because we are all so absorbed with our crisis. We are so taken by the catastrophe that these forces are, are producing in our own countries that our capacity to interact as we did in the past is really very, very jeopardized. And I'm saying that from the point of view of somebody that has been doing transnational work for the last 30 years. I have never seen myself in a situation such as we are living today, and I have international connections. There's no time to cope with the national tragedies and then be able to nurture the transnational connections. It, this requires an incredible effort, and I think this is one, one obstacle that we have to seriously address and think about. The other piece that I want to add to that is that I think that there are main challenges huh, to counter strategies. And one of them, in my view, is that I'm, I'm picking up 
the, the Latin American example, for sure, Latin American feminists are now known worldwide for New Namenos, the Green Scarf, the March for Abortion. We are all over the screens and the first pages. We have done, not everywhere, but in a large number of countries, an incredible mobilization for abortion rights in these very difficult conditions of today. Just to remind that we had three abortion national reforms since 2020. So that's really amazing and needs to be appraised and valued. Yeah. The green scarves were in the Brooklyn Bridge in New York a few days ago to protest against the, the, the potential court decision on Roe versus Wade. Having said that, I think we have not been as good as we should have been in terms of intersectional politics. And this is very problematic because as we have seen in this panel, and I myself spoke about, the right wing, the fascists, <laughs> the conservative force, whatever we name them, oh, we may have a discussion about terminology here, but they are decidedly intersectional. They are doing intersectional politics. They are capable of moving beyond their differences. And perhaps the best example is the coalition, the ecumenic conservative coalition between Catholic, Catholics and evangelicals in Latin America, but there are other examples. And I would say that we are not as good at that than they are, and this is also another big challenge. And lastly, um, uh, something that has been raised by Eileen, but I want to expand it, from within the feminist realm itself, I think we have a big conceptual and political prop challenge, the f a, a big challenge with the women question. Uh, the woman category, and I'm going back to Judith Butler for a space of gender trouble here, because we are in a situation where these forces we have been talking about, they are female, they are women forces, they are women figures, they are recruiting a lot among women, young women, they have their female voices, like our ministers, the people I have spoken about here, Marine Le Pen, Kathleen Novak, and the list can go on. How are we going to deal with that in a consistent manner? It's not an easy question. And in addition to that, as Eileen has mentioned, in this ecology, this complex ecology of anti-gender politics and connected with that right-wing assemblies, we now also have the anti-gender, anti-trans feminist streams that are at the same time anti-gender and anti-patriarchy that are creating lots of fissures and fractures in addition to to the vicious and totally unacceptable attack they are perpetrating against the existence, the very existence of trans people. And so um, I, I regret not being able to give very brilliant ideas, but I think that these conditions are to be named if you want to solidly think about potential counter strategies in the conditions we are operating. Thank you, Sonia. I think we are run out of time, but uh, we maybe, yeah, 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 we maybe can make another round, another last round of questions. Thank you very much for the, the panel. I have a question to Eva, a comment and a question. Um, I'm part of, so to pick up on your um, Paul Mason's anti-fascism, is it only for boys or for men? <laughs> I think it's a very important uh, point that you raised. I would like to ask uh, to you to elaborate on that. Um, I'm part of uh, Anti-Fascist Europe, the, the project um, um, uh, that RLS is also coordinating. 
and uh, yeah, we are a team of uh, a collective and a project, and we are, um, I don't know, about 20 people, and we are uh, three women, I think, in the group. Um, and it's not that uh, RLS doesn't want to recruit women, rather the opposite, but that they are difficult to find, um, and that the anti-fascist movement is overwhelmingly um, monopolized by cis men. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, and I think um, I, I wanted to ask you um, about maybe if you could elaborate on strategies of anti um, feminist anti-fascism. Um, yeah, because how to find uh, um, the one's place as a woman in this movement without adopting masculine codes, um, such as, I don't know, one example, maybe too personal, but like the drinking culture, for example, or other types of yeah codes. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for this fantastic panel. Um, I really appreciated um, not, not just, I mean, the fact of the panel and the fact of this discussion in this conference, uh, but also the links that many of you made between just claiming the, the centrality of, of um, gender and feminism to struggles over democracy and to de-democratization. Um, and I, I just wanted to... Um, I guess raise a question, and it falls directly on, on what Sonia has said too about intersectionality. So obviously, there's a there's, I mean, already huge challenges in terms of gender and trans and feminism and LGBT. You know, there, like that's a whole substantive area of struggle and and difficulty and and intersectionality right there. But I I would just like to pose a question to anybody on the panel who wants to address it, and that's the question about race. Because it seems to me that um, that the literature on anti-feminism and on anti-genderism is really strong in all the ways that you have articulated, but it's it really is quite silent on questions about race. And uh, coming out of a North American context, of course, you know this has been really central to feminist politics over the last number of decades. And uh, I'm just wondering about how you might think about or want to address questions about race and or race and nation in relation to what you've said and or racialized geopolitics. Because the question about um, you know, the reversal of anti-colonialism also um, you know, has a racial dimension. And if, um, if anti-fascist feminism doesn't also think about its positionality vis-a-vis -vis race, then it's missing something very important, it seems to me. Thank you to the amazing panelists and this impressive display of um, feminist analysis. I'm very grateful for all of you. Um, I have a question that's directed mostly to Sonia because it comes from, it originates, let's say, from the Brazilian context, but it's probably also something that maybe the others want to address, which is the question of, let's say, the role of the left vis-a-vis um, -vis the presence of the religious in politics. If we think of people like maybe Pastor Henrique Vieira, who's like been the strong advocate of, let's say, a more direct dialogue with uh, the religious in politics, who sees himself as upholding um, maybe like feminist and ecological uh, theology and who sees himself as like one of the defenders of like leftist um, evangelical uh, politics, then um, is there something to be said for the left having kind of like missed and maybe like also permitted in a certain sense this like, um, yeah, the sort of like advancement and, 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 and swing towards the right in, in uh, yeah, in, in the majority of, of the religious figures that we see nowadays in, in politics. Thank you. Uh, one, one more, maybe? Sorry for asking again. I just want to touch on the thing of use of new colonialist, you know, this colonial argument. The problem within, of course, this is uh, like, you know, black feminists, all sorts of uh, non-white feminists are 
talked about this this problem of also look you know within the feminist movement even i mean in india also this is a problem the thing of looking at is you know if we can also get into the social darwinist mode of like the western this thing as like the best you know which is also problematic and then not looking at within your own indigenous traditions because i come from a matrilineal background and my great grandmother uh, husband was not an important figure he'll come to this house and go away you know and you can't beat up a woman within her own household which was mostly run by women you know and uh, the of course that i'm not to romanticize this but from that to this enforced couple the man and woman like you know or like you know or and again in the lgbtq also reproducing the same same thing again and again which is very good for capitalism to have these capsules who sit in one place uh, so this kind of a thing of like you know i mean not to fall into that darwinistic thing and to also look at indigenous traditions and like you know a modern a so called modernization as the answer to it which also gets problematic at times So, who wants to start? I could maybe start uh, with the um, anti-fascism for boys. That's always a good question. So basically, when you do anti-fascist um, organizing, you can always make a public meeting concerning the structure, the composition of the movement. That's always a good start. And then, you, because I don't know the German context, I'm, I'm not living here at the moment, unfortunately. So I cannot give like more specific advice of don't invite, you know, somebody or... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm kidding now, but basically it's very practical. It's a very, very practical uh, question. And it's not about how do we find women and trans people who want to join us. This is, I think, the, not a good direction. I think the opposite is necessary. So basically, who are we? Who are we? How do we? How do we emphasize? What, what what do we emphasize? Do we want, you know, do we want the struggle that is clearly available only to fully abled people? For instance, there are all kinds of people who would like to join the Antifa. I believe. I believe most most population is anti-fascist at heart. But the question is, you know, how? So my exa my experience from 20 years ago was that we we had this very tiny anti-fascist, uh, anti-authoritarian, fe radical feminist queer group. And we thought we were on the like radical left uh, side of the spectrum to such an extent that no normal people would ever even think of joining us. And the interesting thing was that the opposite happened. So what happened was that since we were in 2002 or three, we were making uh, queer parties, which were the some of the first um, places where you could go and be within queer community without having a special password or special, you know, the, 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 the LGB, the, basically LGB people were sort of really not very seen in Warsaw publicly. And then suddenly we made queer parties. So parties that were open to basically anyone. And suddenly we had like trans person in their 60s and 70s coming and saying, listen, we are not professionals, but we would like to make a performance here with you. We, we are not anarchists, unfortunately. We're, we're sorry for that, but we like it here and we want to belong. So basically the opposite. So we didn't really like follow, we didn't try to find the people, but we made a set of events that had a composition, had a, so think about that, of, do, of doing something that could possibly in, uh, be more inviting. And also, I think it is a moment when we have to rethink our strategies and uh, you know, talk about them again. The same goes with the question of strategy, reform or revolution. Do we want to collaborate with governments? And sometimes those governments might be social democratic, but in fact very neoliberal, for instance. And this is a difficult question then. So how do we strategize? Do we want to be more transversal? You remember uh, Felix Guattari and this notion of transversality, which basically means pursuing social change in all different layers and formats of society. The question of reform and revolution was asked also by Rosa Luxemburg, so I'm saying about, uh, speaking about it not without a reason, because it is always important to rethink when and where we are right now and what it means to be reformative, what it means to be revolutionary, what it means today. We don't ask these questions because we assume that 19th century based definition still apply and they do not. 
because we are in a different context. For instance, we can meet in persons in such a diversified uh, community. This was not the case 20 years ago here in Berlin. I, I did participate in anti-fascist, anti-authoritarian struggles, and it was more difficult to have people coming from so many different regions at the time. And yet, so we can meet here. So how do we build this, for instance, anti-colonial strategy in order to take back our vocabulary from the right wing. Well, for me, it, is double, it, it has two complications because on the one hand, I'm thinking Europe is very racist, we have to deal with it, but also being East European, I'm thinking Central Eastern Europe has, been has disappeared from the map again. We are one of those holographic uh, regions, you know. We sometimes are on the map, sometimes not. And when I say it, it could be taken as a as somehow offensive to people from the global south, for instance, because people might think, okay, we are finally discussing racism in a serious way, in a structural way, and yet there is this somebody from Eastern Europe who's like, I'm white, I'm from Europe, but I again want to rethink you know, the legacy of my region or whatever rela international relations on that level. So the question is also how do we not compete with our minoritarian, differently minoritarian, but minoritarian perspectives, for instance? How do we not get ourselves into this divide at impera because <laughs> this is also a problem, right? So how intercontinentally, how do we discuss uh, anti-racism? So this was also a, a, an answer to. Uh, and then left uh, versus religion is a very important question. Also because, for instance, in Poland, to say I'm anti-Catholic very often has a class, has a class, um, has a class a stereotype, class bias within. So if in Poland you're very strictly anti-Catholic, which I think politically would be a necessary position, but in the context of social conversations, social debates, and strategizing for the movements, for the left, etc., this is not the best thing to say in the first place because there are so many people who are firm believers in Catholicism and yet who would not support Opus Dei. So building a kind of narrative, this is a very difficult, uh, a, 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 a very difficult question. How do we criticize Pope Francis, but also Pope John Paul II, who basically killed radical uh, religious movement in South America? I, I, I cannot take the responsibility, but I have to mention it, right? That's what he did. He was basically making it possible for the radical Christian movements in South America to be uh, uh, destroyed. Of course, and and uh, so 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 we need to think about about religion in a very strategic way because I believe it's it's a complex topic. So I hope I answered to something, and I'll pass it on. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, just uh, thanks for your patience, and I will be very brief. But on this issue of race issue, I find it very important. But I think before, not before, but. To introduce race to the analysis, we should also switch the question, why? What I mean by that? This is also about counter strategies. In, in Turkey, at least until 2010s, the mainstream feminist strategy was to tell the state what to do. So the main qu feminist question was what the state should do. The state should do this reform, take this strategy, implement this policy. And this, unfortunately, then I cannot unquote, but go to Nancy Fraser, this was co-opted by the state to the benefit of aggrandizing the state power. That's, that was the case. Without switching this question from what the state, should, the state should do to what kind of a state do we want, however we introduce the race, it remains only as if as an additive category of what the state should do to protect its, uh, I don't know, quote, quote non-white citizens. Uh, but what kind of a state do we want as all equal c citizens living in that state? This is something, another question. I don't think this is the same question, telling what the state should do and asking what kind of a state do we want. In short, I think feminists should claim power, not regret or leave aside the question of power. Feminism should repoliticize itself. The enjoyization turn in Turkey was so deep the politicization of feminist demands were so deep that introducing new categories are not helping, but depoliticizing again and again the claim to power. Well, okay, I will just... And about the co colonial problem, a couple of sentences, because it's very core to political Islam, because the, one of the main um, arguments of political Islamist actors is that anti-feminism is foreign, right? It's, it's colonial legacy. It's, feminism is colonial legacy, sorry. So... Um, well, in the Turkish case, it sounds a bit uh, uh, 
not well because uh, Turkey was never colonized in that sense. Turkey was is coming from an empire, imperial uh, position, on the contrary. But what is important, I find, why this uh, mm, this discourse is so pervasive is also because we have never um, studied Occidentalism as much as we paid attention to Orientalism. Occidentalism, so the reverse of Orientalism, is also as powerful as Orientalism. But we don't pay enough attention, if you ask my idea. And therefore, this twisted use of colonial uh, or decolonization argument by far right is so possible, it's so common. I, I, it is my idea. OK, thanks. <laughs> Thank you again, and just two brief comments. Um, first, the question about whether fascism is only for boys. We could reformulate it on whether anti-neoliberalism, in Latin America in my case, or whether progressivism or the left have been only for boys too. What we have during the Latin American pink tide at the beginning of, of the century is that many women came out um, of poverty and that gender approach was institutionalized, but there were also um, a race of the feminization poverty index, and that's very, very important. I mean, women today are more likely to fall into poverty than men, and that, that happened during the pink tide at the beginning of the century during the progressive uh, governments. So the question of whether anti-neoliberalism is only for men is an open question and extremely important considering that the complexity between sectors of the left, uh, the complicity, sorry, between sectors of the left and, and neoconservatism um, I'm thinking of political leaders, but also of party configurations, unions, and very, very different spaces uh, of the left. And that's especially important in the case of Latin America when it seems that there will be more possibilities for the left in the next elections in Brazil, but also and also in Colombia, in the um, um, current process, political process in Chile and, and so on. And it is also vital if we um, take into account the consolidation of this right-wing intersectionality you know, that Sonia spoke about a few minutes ago. And um, trying to make a dam against leftist neoconservatism, I, I think that is a very core of the uh, feminist politics um, nowadays. And finally, the issue of race is vital because, vital because it, an important part of the neoconservative bases, at least in Latin America, are based on popular sectors. Then at the same time, time are racialized sectors. So a fight against neoconservatism cannot indirectly become in any way a class struggle against the popular classes or a racist one against racialized people. In fact, the neoconservative argument, and this is a key point, is that feminists don't care about the people. So, and the people in, in, in their argument are the, the poor people, the people of color, uh, the women, and, and so on. So feminist politics, uh, popular and community feminisms are, but also um, urban and academic feminists, and those of, all, of us uh, at this conference have to live up to this situation and confront it with democratic politics. Um, <clears throat> Sonia is going to close our panel because we are out of time. It's, it's there, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> very briefly on if anti-fascism politics is just for boys. From a Latin American perspective, I would say no, but for, for that perception and practice to be overcome, uh, lots of work are still required to persuade 
not just even the left or the anti-facet, even potential more central liberal <laughs> sectors that are so important now, for example, in the fight against Bolsonaro, political fight against Bolsonaro, that gender and sexuality are central to the political project of the right wing. That understanding is not settled down. We are very far from that. And this is still work to be done, regrettably. No? Uh, on race, Janet, is a key question. Although always recognizing that races and slavery is inherent to the very formation of capitalism itself and the nation state, in current conditions, racialized politics vary widely across context. And those variations need to be taken into account when we try to give a response to that. Even in Latin America, huge variation. So I can speak more on Brazil that somehow mirrors more closely what the US race politics dynamics. And what I want to say about that is that on the positive side, uh, in these conversations around the right wing and anti-genderism and uh, Bolsonaro politics, the last few years, um, there are dynamics that are contributing a lot to a better intersectional dialogue. Huh? Some is older, like black feminism, but it was very strong and very well organized. So that provides for an incredible platform of conversation. But I would say that more recently, the growth of religious racism against Afro-Brazilian religious spiritual tradition uh, is a point of encounter between anti-gender politics and anti-racist politics. And lots of conversations have been taking place in that respect, very fruitful. Secondly, uh, since 2014, more or less, as affirmative action politics, policies have been adopted, quotas for universities, and we have had gains in racial inequality in relation to racial inequality and discrimination, we also got uh, the buzzword of reversal, reverse racism. So this is a big buzzword in, in Brazilian politics right now, the accusation of reversed racism in relation to anything that aims at equalizing the drastic and unacceptable racial inequality and levels of racism that persist in Brazilian society. And that provides another in incredible place for a conversation because it, it, the same forces that are deploying anti-gender discourses are the ones that are deploying the, the device of reverse racism as, and other similar devices. So there's also a place there to discuss. On the other hand, there's a, an obstacle and a big challenge, is that the conservative popular basis of evangelism in Brazil, fundamentalist evangelism, is strongly black. A high percentage of that basis is black. And that creates a, a very complicated uh, situation for everybody, but particularly for the, the Brazilian feminist black movement, because they have to cope with that in their own context of politics. Um, but I think that we have been able to, to move quite far in that respect more recently, and that's very positive. And that leads me to your question, Ulrich. Oh, yes. My, my perception is that politicians, by and large, look at religious, religion or religious bases or religious people merely as voters. Huh? their understanding and analysis of, of the complexity, complexity of the, the religious, of the politics of the, religio, the religious and the complexity of religious itself is very limited. Huh? 
And that instrumental approach to religion is very problematic, particularly in this context where religion, conservative rightwards religion is playing such a role. In that context, I would say that a main challenge, that I, I have been writing about that for quite a long time, is to provide space for the plurivocality of religious voices to come out. I think that's critical. In the case of Brazil, it's critical and it's very positive that a wide variety of evangelical voices have come up in the public sphere, expressing a different view of the fundamentalist views on gender, on religious, what they do in terms of attacking Afro-Brazilian religion. This is very important, even if those groups are still a minority, but they, we have to provide for the sustaining of their voices in the public sphere, uh, because they are so important and relevant. On the other hand, it's much more complicated to do that with the Catholic world, hmm? because of Francis. That creates lots of ambivalence. Huh? As a good Jesuit, he creates confusion and ambivalence, and nobody knows exactly what is going on. Huh? He's Peronista and Jesuit, so that's a big problem. Huh? Oh yes, Francis, have you seen what Francis did yesterday? He has a coalition with Bono to promote the convergence between girls' education and the protection of the environment. This is his last campaign, okay? So it's very hard to cope with that because he covers up for the radical ultra-Catholics. Huh? Opus Dei and TFP, the, the mother of Ordo Iuris, they are always hiding beneath uh, the skirts of Francis. Huh? Or they are hiding beneath the stringency of the evangelical pastors. For me, it's very strange that, and it, but it's very difficult to break. Huh? It's much more difficult, well, Catholics, for free choice in Brazil. Catholics for the right to decide is the main voice. They are very important. But they are still more minority in that the Catholic field than the evangelical plural voices. So uh, it, it's vital to do that and, um, and we can keep going. But I think the problem of th the Catholic universe is, is another big challenge to be studied, criticized, and politically addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you all for this amazing panel. Thank you all for coming.